Hello everyone. Today I would like to deliver a lecture on lead blight disease of tomatoes and potatoes. Tomatoes and potatoes are important vegetables um, of in the world and and but unfortunately lead blight disease is still uh, threatening their production. Therefore keeping in view the importance of tomatoes and potatoes as well as the effect of this disease on the production of tomatoes and potatoes I have prepared this lecture on uh, extensive lecture on lead blight disease and so let's begin so today's uh, lecture contents are introduction I will introduce the disease then I will describe the symptoms and signs then i will talk about the pathogen and disease cycle then i will talk about how to control how to manage this disease and finally what are recent studies going on in lead blood disease in the world and finally the references from where i have got information so first introduction As you know, the lead blight disease is caused by an oomycete, and oomycetes are also known as water mold. And that oomycete is Phytophthora infestans. So here is a model of Phytophthora infestans. So you can see these are the uh, potato leaves, and uh, that the hyphae grows upward like this. So this is a, a model and this is an electronic microscopy of Phytophthora infestans. So you can see the hyphae grows up and later we discuss what are these structure. So, so Phytophthora leg blight disease is caused by Phytophthora infestan and Phytophthora infestan belongs to oomycete. Remember, oomycetes are not true fungi but fungi like water molds so what are true fungi what are oomycete in the next few slides i will tell you in detail phytophthora infestan a lead blight disease and phytophthora infestan host on which phytophthora infestan feeds are tomato and potato while host like Sulanum dalcamara and Sulanum saccharides, bittersweet and hairy nightshades, even petunia, the ornamental plant, is infected by Phytophthora infestans. You know, Phytophthora infestans is a species name, but Phytophthora infestans had different strains, and those strains we call clonal lineages. A colonial lineage is like B24 is another lineage or strain. B23 is another lineage or strain. So different lineages. What these colonial lineages do? Because several colonial lineages affect both tomato and potatoes, but some lineages are specific to one, one host or the other. So you have to remember this. So Yes, you know, late blight disease was a major culprit in 1840 European, 1845, 1852 Irish, and 1846 Highland potato famines. So I have told you in this slide that oomycete are not true fungi. So what is major difference between true fungi and oomycete? In this table, we will discuss this in detail. Oomycetes form oospores. Fungi form zyospore, ascospore and basidiospore. This is first difference. The second difference, oomycetes vegetative nuclear state is diploid, while the fungi vegetative nuclear state is haploid or dikaryotic. Dikaryotic mean 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 the hyphae don't fuse 
sorry, the nucleide or fuse, they are in the same hyphae. And but the most important difference is cell wall component. The cell wall component of omyces are made of cellulose and metadevulcan. But the cell wall of fungi or true fungi, we call it we call them true fungi, is made up of chitin. So this is major difference. The other major difference is omycete move by zoospores, but the zoospores are biflagellated. Biflagellated mean they have two flagella. In fungi, they rarely produce flagella, but if they produce flagella, they have one flagella. Whether the flagella is posterior, whether it is like whiplash, but one flagella. So the other importance, mitochondria here, who my seed, tubular cristae and in fungi is flattened cristae. But zoospore is very important in seed to discriminate seed from fungi like here. So this is a zoospore of seeds. So you can see there are two flagella. One flagella. One flagellum is tinsel flagellum and the other flagellum is whiplash flagellum. This is whiplash flagellum, this is tinsel. And this arrow shows the movement of the spore. So these are major differences between omyces and fungi. So now you have understood that lead blight disease, a lead blight disease pathogen phytopter and is an omycid, but not fungi. So, lead blight disease was first described by M. J. Berkeley. And M. J. Berkeley, uh, this guy is M. J. Berkeley. But, but, that lead blight disease is caused by Phytoptera infestan, but not by the result of spontaneous generation. And then that statement was said by this guy and this is Anton Deberry. He rejected spontaneous generation because researchers or people at that time believe that that and this this disease, lead blight disease, is because of spontaneous generation from the decaying vegetation. But the scientist Anton Deberry rejected and said no. It is not because of spontaneous generation, but because of seed and that seed is Phytoptera infesta. That's why Anton Dibari is has many contributions in plant diseases, so it is he is considered as father of plant pathology. So I have already talked about this Phytoptera infesta is a species and within the species there are strains and those strains are called clonal lineages. So like these two are the clonal lineages. So Phytoptera infestan originated here and this is this this is central Mexico. But some people say that Phytoptera infestan originated here. At any way the Phytoptera infestan originated here or here, but Phytoptera infestan diverged from here to the Africa, to the Europe, and to the whole world. So, I, 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 the, the purpose to show this map is that, that Phytoptera infestan spread from here to the world or spread from here to the world. So, as migration and diversification of Phytoptera infestan lineages, Harp one and US one lineages, strands, clonal lineages, we also call them clonal lineages are strands. So as Phytoptera infestan is causing lead blight disease, and lead blight disease uh, has contributed a lot in great, great Irish famine, uh, Ireland in 1845 to 52, 1 million to stereo to death and force another 2 million to immigrate because of lead blight disease. Lead blight disease is not only a factor, but uh, uh, lead blight this disease rule cannot be neglected. Why? Because 
Lead blight disease has affected the whole European countries, but not only Ireland, but Ireland uh, uh, hit Ireland the hardest. Why? Because Irish people grow only one variety, and that variety was lumber. But the lumber potato variety had lack of genetic variability. So uh, the lumber had lack of genetic variability. So the lead blood disease has destroyed the whole potatoes in Ireland and caused great Irish famine, one billion to starve to death and two millions to immigrate. As I have told you, some scientists say that central Mexico is is center of origin of the disease, while some say that no, central Mexico is not uh, origin center of origin. And this is the origin. Why? Because they say that uh, and this is origin because the origin of potatoes is Andes. Central Mexico is in North America. Andes mountains are in South America. So. As you can see, this is an illustration of Irish famine, and uh, these are the Andes Andes mountains. And some researchers think that because potatoes are originated here, uh, so maybe lead blight has also originated here, because both lead blight disease and potatoes have co-evolved with each other. Some scientists think like that. Anyway, at any way, uh, lead blight disease is very still severe. Recent, it's like recent study. One study placed the annual cost of potato lead blight at ten billion dollar in today's dollar, with just chemical control, representing ten to twenty percent of the total cost of the production. So, still, lead blight disease is causing problems in the world, causing Mm, losses to the potatoes and tomatoes, cause losses to the farmers. So you know, slate blight disease is still here, and it is continuously threatening potato and tomato production. Our next topic is septums and signs. So first tomato. So as you can see. Uh, on the leaves and stems of tomatoes, you can see large brown blotches and uh, some grey edges. So you can see uh, symptoms of lead blight disease on tomato leaves and tomato stem. So in tomato fruits, you can see dry brown rot. So this is kind of rot here, rot here. So these are the symptoms of lead blight disease on on the tomato fruits. So, in, in, in outside, you can see some white spores. So, powdery type white spores. These are the indication of lead blight disease on the tomato fruits and tomato stem, tomato leaves. Now, we will go to potatoes. On potatoes, as you can see, blackish or brown layer on leaves. So on the leaves you can see blackish or brown lesions and on the stem you can see blackish or brown lesions on the stem as well and on tubers, potato tubers you can see blackish, brownish, clear brownish, blackish and when you cut the tubers, inside of the tubers you can see brownish, blackish. So these are all symptoms of lead blight disease on tomatoes as well as on potatoes. So our next topic is uh, pathogen and disease cycle. So Phytophthora infestan uh, was first named uh, Botrytis infestan. So Phytophthora infestan is from Greek virus, phyto mean plant the second this one thora mean destroyer so simply phytophthora mean plant destroyer the mycelium of phytophthora infestan is hyaline and synocytic family name piranosporaceae kingdom staminopyla productions 
sex asexual one mating type is needed sexual two mating types are needed so now we will discuss in detail about the reproduction of phytophthora in piston so as you can see here and the leaves as well as tubers are infected by the lead blight disease so what will happen so you can see the hyphae this is the the, the lead blight phytophthora infestan produce a hyphae and that hyphae is called sporophore or sporangiophore and on the sporangiophore you can see this bubble type shape and this is actually this one and that is called sporangium and inside the sporangium you can see ball like structure these are zoospores so now now i am talking about asexual reproduction so in asexual reproduction only one mating type goes on from sporangium this is sporangium now look sporangium directly germinate when temperature is about 21 to 26 sporangium directly germinate and infect the potatoes and tomatoes that is called direct germination but look it is infecting but when the temperature is cool wet conditions and temperature is about in the range of 12 to 18 degrees centigrade what will happen sporangium doesn't directly germinate it produce juice spores look here juice spore it has two each juice spore has two flagella then these juice spores uh, infect potatoes and tomatoes so in this this cycle is just asexual and only uh, one mating type and so this is asexual reproduction and about this if the temperature is 12 to 18 degrees centigrade it produces juice spores but when the, the temperature is warm and the, the, the temperature range is this then it directly infect the potatoes and tomatoes so you have to remember it sporangium directly infect potatoes and tomatoes or it produces juice spores then juice spores infect potatoes and tomatoes so because this there is only one mating type so this is asexual reproduction but in in sexual reproduction two two gametangia one is enthridium the other is ogonium i mean two mating types its nuclei are here and its nuclei are here when they when the nuclei come in one place I mean they didn't fuse here they are here but they didn't fuse and their structure is called oospore I mean when two mating types combine together uh, then they form oospore and then oospore is a very hard structure it survives under harsh environment for a very long time so oospore is a special survival structure so it survives in soil for a long time in the form of oospores. So when but inside both mating type enthridium and ugonium nuclei are here, they didn't fuse. When they fuse, that is called karyogamy. When kamine karyogamy, when they fuse, but still oospore, but, but but the nuclei become one because N N when the N N combine it become now two two N can see here so this is also a spore so when the when the two nuclei combine it is called karyogamy and what that what does do? this o spore then germinate they produce sporangium then they infect so this this part is called sexual reproduction because it consists of two mating type or two gametangia ogonium and enthridium but this part has only one mating type this is called asexual reproduction and the other important thing 
is is moisture cool nights warm days in extended wet conditions moisture is also very important if these conditions are there then you can expect lead blight disease on your potatoes and tomatoes and also remember about the temperature so these are all about the reproduction of lead blight disease now we will go to another topic our topic last now may, may not be last topic second last management how can we manage this disease first is cultivars unfortunately we don't have any cultivars no potato cultivar is immune but some cultivars are more resistant than others but uh, not any cultivar is uh, 100% resistant or because almost every potato cultivar is immune and, uh, sorry is susceptible to lead blight disease but because of environmental condition the pathogen cannot uh, establish itself and maybe that's why it seems that cultivars are resistant but the truly is that nowadays no cultivar is fully resistant against the lead blight disease maybe some transgenic cultivars may be resistant but look here european variety pent lendel bearing r1 gene resistant one resistant two resistant three genes it seemed to be immune to lead blight when released in 1961 but resistant broke down in 1967 so from 61 to 67 just within 6 years within 6 year it resistant broke down so this is the situation so we we can manage this disease by potato cultivar resistant potato cultivar but we don't have any resistant potato cultivars now another manage we can manage this uh, culture practices i suggest these culture practices because by this culture practices we can change the environmental conditions for the lead blight disease and lead blight disease uh, infection can be minimized i can't say that it infection becomes zero no can be minimized but i suggest culture practices like good drainage and good air environment you need to place row to row and plant to plant spacing potatoes you don't need to have a dense planting you need to row to row plant to plant distance should be maintained the other is rotate potatoes with the legumes you need to rotate the crops or other crops rotation is very important and the infected tubers or any tubers that is left in the previous season should be eliminated because they are the source of infection and volunteer plants weeds should be completely removed and if certified seed tuber you should you should buy certified seed tubers from the companies and the healing and tilling around the plants to remove weeds this is also very important and uh, minimize the time they lose are wet to help prevent foliar infection it means that you don't need to give more chances to become potatoes leaves tomato leaves become wet for longer time you don't need like suppose you are applying water in the evening what will happen the whole night the water will remain on the leaves and the water is if if there is water then you can expect lead blight disease so don't irrigate water in the evening or in the late evening and uh, you don't need to irrigate uh, uh, water every time you just stay uh, you need to fix a specific time at that time you need to irrigate your put your potatoes and uh, tomatoes the second thing is excess of nitrogen fertilizer fertilization should be avoided you don't need to apply nitrogen as fertilizer because this make the plant very soft they increase the growth and they make the plant very soft and the plant becomes susceptible to uh, to the disease to the lead blight disease now chemical control these are some systematic fungicides if your plants tomatoes and potatoes are infected by lead blight disease 
you can apply this systematic uh, fungicide but I can't guarantee whether these fungicides are are uh, eco-friendly or not I can't guarantee but these are some of the systematic fungicides we are biology I also suggest biological control but uh, so far no biological control is 100% effective in the field conditions recently this chitomium uh, globosum was used against lead blood disease and uh, when you treat the 1 kg tubers with 1 ml spores of this uh, this can control the lead blood disease but uh, about the results in the field I am not uh, um, I don't know about the results in the field whether it will be effective or not because some bio biocontrol agents most of the bio biological control agent cannot adapt them slows under field condition but greenhouse greenhouse like this kind of experiments some of them are most of them are working but in the field some may be work but most of them cannot work because uh, you, 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 because the weather conditions are changing because of the even because of the climate change changes and the other thing another very important I, I also want to give this suggestion for casting models if we know about the weather conditions of an area of our location then we can forecast and we can prevent our plants from the disease and we can also prevent our cellos from spending money on fungicides so forecasting models is okay that is also called precision agriculture precision agriculture precision agriculture has emerged as a revolutionary technology which transforms farming related data into useful information for agriculture decision making these include the integration of location specific weather forecast into plant disease model as a part of crop so you are integrating the local uh, forecast uh, models and you predict that the disease will come in this month, in this week, disease will be severe, you need to apply fungicide, you don't need to apply fungicide like this. So this is kind of very good forecasting model like here is a forecasting models. So. We can also protect our plants by using forecasting from the late blood disease by using forecasting models. And uh, now we talk about the recent studies. So we will talk about the uh, recent studies. So in res recently, scientists are studying genetic variation. Remember, genetic variation in Phytoptera infestum may be harmful to Phytoptera infestum, may be useful to Phytoptera infestum. Not every genetic variation is useful. Remember, how? I will present an illustration. I will present a figure of a very famous research review article so in that article you will understand how the scientist and what are the aspect of phytoptera infestan the scientists are studying recently so this is a figure as you can see in the cell as i have told you in the previous slides that if phytoptera infestan undergo sexual reproduction it has two mating type a1 and a2 so when a1 and a2 mating type fuse with each other through meiosis they produce a spore but in the meiosis crossing over occurs so crossing over what does mean of crossing over crossing over is not same today like the crossing over in the previous day or in the previous year and the previous hour so crossing over is different so different kind of segments of chromosome are crossing over so what we can say we can say 
variation can occur. So scientists are stating about the crossing wars, about the meiosis crossing wars and these things about to understand the lead blight disease pathogen, Phytophthora infestor. And sexual, uh, sexual recombination occur during oosuperongenesis. Like, and second thing is polyplidy can occur. Polyplidy means, you know, Phytophthora infestan is normally 2 and diplide, but sometimes chromosome become double, triple, diplide, tetraplide, and this is called polyplidy. And if polyplidy occur, then of course, that is also a type of genetic variation. Actually, polyplidy how occur? Polyplidy occurs from non-disjunction. Non-disjunction means failure of sister chromatids to spread normally. If the sister chromatids are not separating normally, then what would happen? One cell will get more chromosome, the other cell will not get will get few chromosome or even not even get nothing. So in that situation, that is called polyplidy. So polyplidy is also responsible for the genetic variation. And uh, sometimes gene a gene may delete, a useful gene may delete, a harmful gene may delete. If a harmful gene may delete from the lead blight Phytophthora infestan, that is good for it. If a beneficial gene is deleted from the Phytophthora infestan, beneficial to Phytophthora infestan type gene deleted, then it will be good for plant. So genetic variation may be useful, maybe scientists are studying all this. So deletion, how can delete deletion by intrachromosomal recombinations? Sometime within the chromosome something happen like overlap like So a gene may delete Also variation genetic variation occurs the other thing is epigenetic silencing sometimes genes cannot produce uh, Messenger RNA, I mean genes become inactive they are not translated into messenger RNA and not translate it into a product so that kind of uh, variation and this kind of thing also create genetic variation that is called epigenetic silencing and uh, sometimes a gene disrupt how because because of transposons transposons are the segments of chromosome they jump from one chromosome to another chromosome when they jump sometimes they stuck between the genes and they disrupt the gene function, another gene function and when they when they move from their position to another position and then they uh, when they enter into another position so the chromosome uh, canopy is not like this will not be like the same as previous one so this is also a type of genetic variation so scientists are stating this and duplication sometime and uh, the chromosomes Chromatids cannot crossing over properly because of unequal crossing over duplication may occur like in this figure you you can see here so so that the same gene is duplicated very time so these are uh, cause and scientists now are studying about the genetic genetic variation of the phytophthora in Western. the another thing so this was all about the sexual uh, genetic variation. What about asexual genetic variation? In asexual reproduction, as I have told you, one mating type A1 or A2, one mating type is responsible. Mating type can undergo mutation. Look, or like it has mutated here. So if it is mutated, then zoospore as well as superongia may be different. The originally it is like this, but it has undergo mutated, it becomes different. So sometimes mutation occur in sec asexual reproduction. They also cause genetic variation. And uh, sometimes what would happen, you know, the horizontal genetic transfer, horizontal gene transfer. Sometimes other organism also uh, 
infect uh, Phytophthora infestam. Like virus, like bac bacteria can also inject or infect its DNA into the uh, Phytophthora infestam. In this way, it changed the structure of the Phytophthora infestam and it is also a part of genetic variation. So scientists nowadays are studying uh, deeply about the genetic variation occurring in the uh, Phytophthora infestam. So this is a recent study. The other study is about this. As I have told you, this is Sprungia 4 and these are Sprungia. I have told you Sprungia infect directly or Sprungia produce zoospores and then zoospores infect. But the question is how zoospores detect the plant? Like Zoospores cannot detect fig, cannot detect poplar tree, cannot detect me, cannot detect you. But they detect potatoes and tomatoes and they become happy. They, they think, zoospores think that their host is now potato and they infect directly. But why not us? Why not poplar? Why not fig? Actually, the question is, some sort of signals are coming from potatoes and tomatoes, susceptible potatoes and tomatoes varieties, some signals, some chemical signals. So zoospores detect those signals, those signals and then become cyst and then it produces germ tube and then it produces a prosperium and then it produces, in, it goes inside to the leaves, tubers potatoes, tuber stems and then it produces an astoria and then it infect. So now scientists are studying about uh, what chemicals you suppose detect and infect the tomatoes and potatoes. So scientists are studying like this. And the other things, how does this, even, even after infection, even after infection, the, the, the Phytophthora infestans need signals from the plant, whether any barrier inside of the plant. So there are many types of barrier in the inside the plant. Plant surface is a barrier to pathogen. Plants, even cell wall is a barrier. Plant cell membranes is and cell wall is a barrier. Inside of the cell wall is, is a barrier. Even the nucleus itself, nuclear wall is a barrier, cytoplasm sometimes become barrier. So the pathogen has to cross all their barriers to uh, fit on the plant. So what pathogen is doing? Pathogen produce effectors, effectors, some molecules. And if these effectors like this yellow color, this you, you can see yellow color structures you see star type these are effectors if phytophthora infestan produces these effectors if these effectors are not recognized by the potato and tomatoes then tomatoes and potatoes become infected if these effectors are recognized by the potatoes and tomatoes then they cannot be infected so now scientists are studying about the effectors about the chemotoxic toxic behavior and they, they want to understand how uh, Phytophthora infestan infect the potatoes and tomatoes, what are the chemicals by which, uh, what are the signals and what are the chemicals by which Phytophthora infestan is attracted to tomatoes and potatoes. So scientists are now studying about this. Even they also want to understand and what is Hastoria is doing inside and they they want to understand all these processes now. So these are all the recent studies going on in the world about the Phytophthora infesta. So now finally the reference is from where I have got this information. So the first website I would like to mention that I have got the information from this review paper. How does Phytophthora infestan evade control efforts? Modern insight into the late blight disease. 
so I have got information from this review paper and I am I, I would also like to give reference of this journal this is this uh, about this risk management strategy using precision agriculture technology and I, I would also like to say thank you to this journal to this paper to the authors of this paper as well as to the authors of this papers and uh, third is I also would like to thanks to APS American Phytopathological Society their web page and they have described late blood disease of potatoes and tomatoes in detail so I have got some of the uh, figures of potatoes from their web page and some of the information I have got and uh, I have also I should I, I would also like to thank you to University of Minnesota extension web page and they have described about the late blood disease of potatoes in detail so I have got some of the tomato figures from this web page so I would like to thank you all of this authors and uh, people who have made this informative web pages informative websites finally I also would like to thank you all of you who are watching this who are watching are hearing are listening to this lecture so I would like to say thank you all of you thank you